Summer's Bard Music Festival is dedicated to the uh, life and career of the Russian composer Sergei Rachmaninoff. Uh, we've been asked um, why we're doing Russian music in the shadow of the Russian aggression on Ukraine and the Russia-Ukraine war. And um, one explanation is purely um, logistical. We don't choose the subjects of the music festival a uh, few months in advance, we choose it years in advance, and uh, the scholars and the uh, performers and everyone involved in the festival uh, has a very long uh, window of preparation. The second, of course, is that um, to say that uh, Sergei Rachman was a Russian composer is absolutely true, but it's not the quite the same Russian composer uh, image that you might have of a, um, of a kind of a official uh, composer. Tchaikovsky was, in some sense, uh, a quasi-official composer of the uh, last decades of the 19th century under the Romanov dynasty. He wrote music for the coronation of Alexander III. And uh, um, later in Russian history, Shostakovich uh, was a um, a protagonist of the Soviet regime, and although there are ambivalences and dissidences in Shostakovich's relation to the regime and moments of fear and of, of anger and dissent and despair, um, he was the most decorated musician of the Soviet period and um, <clears throat> died before uh, the Soviet Union collapsed. Rachmanov represents an entirely different uh, Russia of the 20th century, um, born uh, into a um, privileged noble landowning class uh, with an old ancient lineage. Um, he um, uh, came of age and made his career before the Russian Revolution. So um, most of the compositions uh, that uh, Rachmaninoff produced were produced before 1917 and before 1919 when he fled the Soviet regime. So Rachmaninoff is not a Russian composer, but uh, he lived um, for decades after the Russian Revolution, uh, mostly in the United States and also in Switzerland, where he built a, a home which tried to replicate the favorite um, place in the country in which he had spent so much of his childhood and young adulthood. And he surrounded himself with reminders of the old world that he had lost. In this festival, we're taking a look at a, a figure who was marginalized for most of his career by what looked like the fashionable, forward-looking trends of his time. His ambitions for his music were a kind of immediate connection between the listener and the music. In this festival, we will actually take a look at a lot of his music. We even will do the least well-known of his one-act operas, a setting of a Pushkin text uh, called The Miserly Night, uh, which um, has some overlaps with Shylock and uh, The Merchant of Venice, having to do with a, uh, an extremely greedy uh, uh, knight uh, and his son. And, um, this uh, a darker kind of opera. The other two operas, one is Francesca da Rimini after Dante. And um, we will also uh, take a look at um, The Vespers, which is um, Rachmaninoff's uh, great uh, religious work um, for chorus. And um, we will uh, look at also his first symphony. So. Um, his first symphony um, was performed, um, and it was a disaster, and it was shredded by the critics. Um, many reasons can be adduced for this, uh, among others that the conductor, uh, Alexander Glazunov, was reputed to be, as he often was, extremely drunk, and the whole thing was a fiasco. 
um, Rachmaninoff was devastated and um, had what can only be described as a, uh, a meltdown, uh, what used to be called a nervous breakdown, and he stopped composing. And um, he actually then resorted to something which was very novel, to psychotherapy. And the second piano concerto is dedicated to his psychotherapist, that the most famous piece he ever wrote and the most successful piece he ever wrote on a large scale, the C minor piano concerto, is a kind of tribute to the healing power of psychotherapy. So the festival will explore Rachmaninoff as a Russian composer before 1919 and will explore his post-exilic existence um, in primarily in America, but also in Europe, and will visit contemporaries of his, um, uh, both from his early years, his teachers and his contemporaries in his own lifetime, uh, then sort of parallel phenomena that are completely opposite. Leo Ornstein, the great Russian Jewish emigre pianist who was a really experimentalist, uh, created this shocking piece called Wild Man's Dance. And then a later piece by Orenstein, which is sort of pseudo-Rachmaninoff from the 50s for saxophone and uh, piano. And um, so we will look at sort of uh, the people that surrounded him, um, not necessarily with a biographical connection. Uh, and um, uh, he was an admirer of Rhapsody in Blue, uh, by Gershwin, and we'll also look at um, the shift from the piano to the world of recording. Um, Rachmaninoff came of age when the piano was the universal instrument of musical culture, and um, he lived through it and experienced its decline and its replacement by the gramophone. He believed that a record, now a CD or something like that, is something that could deliver a musical experience for a listener. What he hated was the radio, because he suspected in our multitasking world that we turn the radio on, we go into the kitchen, we go in and out, it's not listening. The same listening you would have if you actually um, were in a concert hall. And he is the last of the giants who were great instrumentalists and great composers. Uh, he was so famous as a pianist and equally famous in the end as a composer. And several of his contemporaries, Buzoni, whose piano concerto we will perform, and Paderewski, the Polish pianist who became a leading political figure after the Treaty of Versailles in the independent Poland, um, they are in the last of the, um, of the real um, towering uh, protagonists of essentially performers who wrote their own material, <laughs> wrote music for themselves and for others, where performing and composition were not as separate as they have become. And um, uh, it is an opportunity for um, listeners to think about themselves and the inherited prejudices about distinctions and judgment uh, with respect to music. And um, an unabashed um, ability not to dwell on the philosophical aspects of what music is, but on the human character of music as a universal attribute of all people. Uh, Charles Ives used to say that there's no such thing as an unmusical person. And um, I think actually Rachmaninoff did believe in an educated audience, but he also believed that as a performer, his job was to educate the public to really appreciate the wonders and the magic of our musical imagination.